timer. Okay, woo. <sighs> well, that's about as high as my energy is going to get this morning. So, well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Perth Andover Baptist Church. Uh, we are a church that seeks to follow Jesus, care for one another, and serve our community. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Nathan Drover, and I'm the lead pastor here, along with Pastor Sheila, and I'm glad you could join us for worship this morning. We do have connection cards in uh, the back. If uh, you're new and you want to uh, fill one of those out, just let us a bit know a bit more about yourself. And uh, yeah, beyond that, we will uh, jump into worship. We're going to um, encounter God this morning through the songs that we sing through the prayers that we pray, and uh, through reflection on his word. And so in order to lead us into that, I want to begin by reading from Psalm 24. The psalmist invites us to uh, lift up our heads. It's a bit of confusing imagery, but it says, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And so this morning, my prayer is that we would uh, encounter the King of glory uh, through all of the elements of this service this morning. Let's uh, quickly pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, I just pray that your spirit would meet us in this place, that those of us who have been exhausted and beaten down and hurt over this past week, that you would meet us in this place to bring us comfort and consolation. I pray for others of us who have had a good week and who are um, ready to encounter uh, you in a way that gives us Uh, guidance and instruction for our lives, that you would also fulfill that need this morning, that we would uh, have this sense of you guiding us and leading us into the week ahead. And so God, uh, whoever we are in whatever situation, uh, we pray that uh, as we have come here, that you would uh, meet us, the King of glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Would you stand with us as we Bring glory to God. We're going to sing glory to God forever. And I'm very happy to have Tammy and Mikhail up here on the platform with me today. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings. Yes, you were, yes, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever, glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Take my life. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take 
take my life and let it be yours. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. We're going to continue singing about God's goodness to us. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? This is amazing grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing love, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. I'll invite you to remain standing as we sing a song. A simple song that talks about what we're trying to do, especially in this month here in January, February, in this season in our church, know more about Jesus from reading the Gospels and thinking and studying more about what Jesus was like and what people said about him when he was here. More about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus would I know more of his grace to others show more of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me more more about Jesus more more about 
Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn, more of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in it. Every line, making each faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness. See, more of His love who died for me. More about Jesus on His throne. Riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase. More of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. Be seated. So we'll take the offering at this time. Those of you who give online are free to give online. If you, those who are unable to give online, that we have this opportunity. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gifts that you give to us. We thank you for what you provided us with. And we pray, Lord, as we give back to you, that you would use these gifts to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Birthdays this week, Monday, Jaden, are you? We have no anniversaries and no other birthdays, so uh, this wasn't a popular week. <laughs> Tonight at 6.30, um, the women are invited here for the next round of the IF uh, breakout sessions. And um, that's a, we'll do a video, Building a Resilient Life, uh, with Rebecca Lyons uh, speaking for that. And then we'll have our discussion time. And then we'll go into the fellowship hall and have some desserts and appetizers and just more time in fellowship and talking. So if you're available at all, uh, ladies, you're welcome to that. Monday, uh, ladies' Bible study at noon for my group. At 6.30 is the River Kids Youth. On Tuesday, we have prayer walk at 1.30. And that evening is the online manuscript Bible study. If you're interested in that, just send a message to Pastor Nathan. Uh, right after the service today, if uh, people would be willing, we'd like to have some help setting up a few tables in the fellowship hall for the ladies' event tonight. Thank you. morning. It's time now that we just bow our heads and uh, go to prayer. Heavenly Fathers, we gather here this morning to give you thanks. We want to give you thanks for loving each one of us. Thank you for caring about us, even the smallest details in our lives. Father, we ask for your blessings on this church, the people who gather here, and for all who serve you in various ministries. We ask you, Lord, to bless those who have taken up uh, different ministries to serve this year, that you will just guide and direct them, and we pray for your blessing on them. We pray tonight for our women's ministry, Lord, that you would bless that and help us to learn to live a resilient life. May your spirit guide us and speak to the ladies that come through the video discussion and through the fellowship and just for 
everything that happens tonight, Lord, we pray for your presence. We pray, Lord, for blessings on our pastors, Nathan and Sheila, that you will guide and lead them in the direction that you wish this church to go. We ask you, Lord, to encourage them on the days that they need encouragement and to strengthen them daily. Lord, we pray for those who we know that are sick, for those who deal with pain and physical issues every day, and for those who are dealing with acute illness. May your healing touch give them strength. Encourage them, Lord, when they need encouragement. Lord, we especially keep Dave Dove in our prayers this morning, who's undergone a very serious surgery. We're grateful, Lord, for that surgery. And we pray, God, for a complete healing for recovery for him. We pray also, Lord, for his family, for Charlotte and Kat and her family and also her brother that's traveling. We pray that you will surround them with peace during this difficult time. We pray also for the wisdom for the people that will be working with Dave. And Lord, we also want to keep Mary Ann in our prayers as she gets prepared for her surgery this month. Calm her fears as she may feel your loving arms around her. And Lord, we continue to pray for those who are grieving, for those who have lost special people in their lives. And especially today, Lord, we remember Barb and, and Rob. Lord, we ask you to fill each of us with your grace, that we may have the strength to face whatever is before us this day and this week. Give us hearts that are grateful for you and for your unending love. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you each and every day. Amen. Well, I'm going to commandeer one of these music stands. Um, as, I, as I do that, uh, I just want to make a quick announcement about our uh, churchwide gospel reading plan. Uh, for those of you who have uh, been around, you know what that is. But for those of you who have not, uh, as a church, we are reading through. Um, we will, we've invited each person to pick a gospel, one of the accounts of Jesus's life, and read through it, study it, uh, really dive deep into it. And that's what that bulletin board in the back is. It's kind of like a sign up. You write your name next to the gospel that you are planning to read. Um, but in addition to that, what I wanted to talk about, what's new, is that I added a question box back there, which I meant to um, have I meant to have up there from the very beginning, but I just failed on that. Uh, but there is a question box back there. It is a uh, Dutera uh, d diffuser box, but it has question box written on the top of it. So just, you know, it's pretty clear what it is. So you can just write your question on a sheet of paper. Um, there are pieces of paper back there colored if you want, or you can just use a regular sheet of paper, put it in there, or you can obviously ask me in person, but if maybe you want it submitted anonymously for some reason, uh, you can do that. And if we get enough questions, the idea is that Sheila and I will do a question and answer Sunday on the Gospels, kind of like we used to do um, a couple of years ago. Well, it wasn't a couple years ago. I don't, I don't know how long ago it was, but you, you uh, would have been around for that. So anyway, I just wanted to announce that, let you know it's back there, and it will stay back there now until whenever we do our question and answer Sunday. So with that being said, we're going to move into our time of reflection on God's word to see what it has to say to us and why it matters for us today. Let's quickly begin with a, another word of prayer. Father, as we come to your word this morning, I just pray that you would open our eyes to see your glory May we behold Jesus, your Son, who is full of grace and truth. Move our hearts as we come to see the exalted King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In a time of great conflict, uncertainty, and political maneuvering, a crowd had gathered at the old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The date was December 25th, 
and the year was 800 AD. Pope Leo was supposed to crown Charlemagne's son as the Holy Roman Emperor. But as Charlemagne completed his prayer, kneeling before the Pope, Leo took the imperial crown and placed it on Charlemagne's head. Now, Charlemagne was already the king of the Franks, but now in what was both a surprise and a cunning political move by the Pope, Charlemagne found himself crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. The coronation of Charlemagne had momentous impact on Western history. Among other immediate political implications, it solidified a relationship between the church, the pope, and the state, the king, that would become known as Christendom. Well, moving forward to the year 1515, the Italian Renaissance artist Raphael painted a fresco or a mural painting uh, of Charlemagne's coronation. Now, I hope that's big enough for you to see in the back there. On the slide behind me, I've, I've zoomed in a little bit. Um, Leo is the tallest one, and Charlemagne is the one kneeling before him on uh, just right of the center there. And as you can see, uh, the depiction of <coughs> the coronation is filled with the pomp and fanfare that you might expect. There are silver vessels in the bottom left corner. There are um, Roman guards and decorated clergy. The boy behind Charlemagne, if you can see him, he's pretty small there, holds Charlemagne's previous crown, the one that represents that he is the uh, king of the Franks, as the larger crown uh, is placed on his head. And the pope himself, as you can see, wears a ornate headpiece and decorative robes. This is the kind of glory we would expect to be associated with a coronation. And coronations in our own day have not diminished the ceremony and splendor of the event. Consider this picture of King Charles. Again, hopefully you can see that one. Uh, this is King Charles in one of his official portraits, released just after his coronation. Everything from his clothes to his crown represents his royal status and majesty. And again, that's exactly what we would expect. Being the king is a big deal. And so coronations come with an element of glory and exaltation. But with those two examples in, of coronations in mind, let me show you one other king's coronation. This morning, we're continuing on in our series, Portraits of Jesus. In this series, it's associated with our church-wide gospel reading plan. And in this series, we're looking at the gospels and how they tell the story of Jesus from different but complementary perspectives. Over the past few weeks, we've looked at Jesus the teacher of, in Matthew. Jesus as the I am in Mark, and Jesus the Savior of all in Luke. This morning, we're going to look at the Gospel of John. And one portrait of Jesus we see in John's Gospel is the portrait of Jesus, the exalted king. But as this painting of Matthias Grunwald reveals, Jesus' coronation is not what we would expect for a king. As we will see, John's gospel fuses Jesus' crucifixion and his kingship together. Jesus being lifted up on the cross is at the same time his exaltation as king. And this portrait of the crucified and at the same time exalted king categorically redefines how we understand kingship and its glory. Kingly glory is no longer found in conquest, accomplishment, and power. Now it is found in the beaten and battered body of Jesus on the cross. Now I know that this probably sounds a little bit strange. It is, at least at first, something of a paradox. 
The cross meant humiliation, death, and shame. So how can it also be Jesus' glory? By the end of this sermon, we'll be in a better place to resolve that paradox. But for now, let's begin at the beginning. And in the beginning, there is Jesus, the King. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to John chapter 1, verses 43 to 50. For a bit of context here, before we uh, get into it, and the text will also be up on the screen, but before we get into the passage, uh, by this point in Jesus' gospel, uh, Jesus has not started his public ministry yet. Not a lot has happened. It's chapter 1. But John the Baptist, who's different than John the author of the gospel, John the Baptist, a different John, has been telling people about Jesus. And because John the Baptist has been telling people about Jesus, Jesus has begun to gather a band of disciples or followers together. And that's where we'll pick up the story in John chapter 1, verse 43. Here's what it says. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite, in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than these. Okay, so the scene begins with Jesus' call to Philip. With the command, follow me, Jesus calls Philip to be his disciple even before his public ministry formally begins. But for our purposes this morning, our focus is going to be on Nathaniel. Initially, Nathaniel has a bit of prejudice against Jesus. It's a prejudice based on where Jesus is from. He's from Nazareth. Nazareth was a smaller community than Nathaniel's hometown. And so just like we can imagine a politician who's from Fredericton thinking that maybe healthcare in Perth Andover isn't all that important, Nathaniel believes Nazareth was an insignificant place. And so he's skeptical at what Philip is claiming, that Jesus could really be the Messiah, who Philip says he is. But when Nathaniel meets Jesus, a conversation ensues that changes Nathaniel's mind. Jesus has some supernatural knowledge of Nathaniel. He knows that when Philip first talked to him, Nathaniel was under a fig tree. And this supernatural knowledge is enough, apparently, to overcome Nathaniel's initial skepticism. In verse 49, Nathaniel confesses his belief in Jesus. He says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, as we talked about a few weeks ago, these two titles are probably a way of saying the same thing for Nathaniel. They both point to Jesus' royal status. It is very unlikely here that Nathaniel believes Jesus is God in the flesh, what we mean when we refer to Jesus as the Son of God. Rather, Nathaniel is calling Jesus the King. It's the same way of saying the same thing. So here we have Nathaniel declaring that Jesus is the king of Israel. And let's just take a step back for a second and think about the significance of this for John's gospel as a whole. This conversation is happening very early on in John's gospel. 
as I already mentioned, Jesus hasn't even started his public ministry yet. But John begins his gospel with an account of Nathanael confessing Jesus as the king of Israel. Let's just think about this in comparison to the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, it isn't until halfway through the gospel that Peter first confesses that Jesus is the Christ, which is another way of saying king. And Peter, as we might know, is one of Jesus' closest followers. And so this contrast should indicate to us how we should think about Jesus in John's gospel. Essentially from page one, we should be thinking about Jesus as a king. And this isn't a one-time event either. <clears throat> as a quick second example, in John chapter 4, Jesus has a much longer conversation with a woman from Samaria. Eventually, the woman says this. In John chapter 4, verse 25, she says, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And here is Jesus' response. Jesus says, I, the one, uh, the one speaking to you, I am he. So in John's gospel, there is no ambiguity. At times, people like Nathaniel confess that Jesus is king. At other times, Jesus himself tells people that he is the Christ, which means God's anointed one. Either way, John makes Jesus' royal status crystal clear. Jesus is unquestionably the Christ, the King of Israel. And like all kings, Jesus is glorified and exalted. He is not just a king. John portrays Jesus as the exalted king. And this is where John's unique portrait of Jesus begins. But this exaltation as I already hinted at at the beginning of the sermon, is not what we would typically think of a king's exaltation or glory. And we can see that in John chapter 12, especially verses 23 to 24. Now before I read those verses uh, from John 12, let me just give us a bit of context again, because we've skipped ahead quite a bit. By John chapter 12, Jesus has finished his public ministry. He has healed the blind, walked on water, and raised the dead to life. Jesus has completed many signs that point to the reality of his kingdom. But Jesus' ministry wasn't all sunshine and roses. At various points, the Jewish authorities tried to seize him and kill him. Sometimes, it was because of what he had taught. Other times, it was because of what he did. But Jesus' life was frequently in danger during his ministry. And Jesus wasn't naive about this. At one point, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In other words, Jesus knew the direction that his ministry was going. Eventually, he would willingly lay down his life for those who followed him. And yet during his public ministry, all the attempts of Jesus' life failed, uh, on Jesus' life failed. John, as the author, gives us a, a big picture theological reason why. He writes that the Jewish authorities could not arrest Jesus because, quote, his hour had not yet come. In other words, it just wasn't Jesus' time. The hour of Jesus' arrest and death was still well into the future. And so with this background in mind about Jesus', uh, the danger of Jesus' ministry and the hour, we'll, um, let's turn to John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, we'll find it marks a turning point in Jesus' ministry. In verse 23, Jesus says this, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. 
So up until this point, as I've already mentioned, Jesus' hour was in the future. It had not yet come. But now, Jesus' hour has come. Jesus knows his end is near. Now he must fall to the ground and die like a kernel of wheat. But notice how Jesus describes his hour, the time of his death. He doesn't say the hour has come for the Son of Man to die. He says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. In this verse, Jesus is creating a link between the hour of his arrest and death and his glorification. Somehow and in some way, Jesus' death is also his glory. And in case we missed it, in verse 23, John makes the same point just a few verses later. If you have your uh, uh, Bible, um, you can look with me at verse 32. In John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And then John, as the author, adds the following explanation in the next verse. In verse 33, John writes, Jesus said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Now, there are two levels of meaning in Jesus' words here. If we know that Jesus dies on a cross, then the first level of meaning uh, is fairly obvious. Jesus is anticipating his crucifixion. Being crucified involves a literal lifting up, so to speak. As the person's body was nailed to the cross and then the wooden stake was put in its place, they were raised up literally above the earth. But there's a second level of meaning here. If you've picked John's gospel to study for yourself, then it might be helpful for you to know that throughout John's gospel, he often uses words that have two possible meanings, and when, when um, a word has two possible meanings, he often kind of intends it in both ways to make an additional point. And so if you see in your Bible that there's a footnote that says this Greek word can also mean something else, chances are John is intentionally using the word to be ambiguous and create two levels of meaning. And that is what he's doing here. The Greek word Jesus uses for lifted up can also mean exalted. And with this ambiguity, John creates a second level of meaning that comes into focus. When Jesus describes himself as being lifted up or exalted, he is not just describing the physical reality of being nailed to the cross. He is also saying that on the cross, he will be exalted. In other words, in John's gospel, Jesus the King is glorious. Jesus the Christ is exalted. But his glory and his exaltation are revealed at least in part in his death. They are fused together in such a way that Jesus is the crucified and at the same time glorified King. And so at this point, we've seen the two themes of Jesus' kingship and his exaltation in John's gospel. In these themes, John is preparing us for Jesus' death. He's helping us to interpret it. He's, he's kind of telling us beforehand what we should think about Jesus' crucifixion when we get there. And so when we see Christ crucified, we should be also thinking Jesus glorified. And like I said at the beginning of the sermon, at first, this is a paradox. No one naturally thinks of glory in this way. But somehow, Jesus' exaltation as king will coincide with his death on the cross. And so this raises the question, how can we make sense of this paradox? That will be our question moving forward for this morning. But before we can talk about it, I think we need to see it. I do not 
just want to tell you about Christ's coronation on the cross. We need to look to the cross for ourselves and to see the glory of the king. And so we're going to take some time to read some selected portions of the account of Jesus' trial, condemnation, and crucifixion as it's recorded in John 18 and 19. As we do, you will see how John, as the author, merges Jesus' kingship with the cross. And so, consider this your invitation to the king's coronation. Come and see the exalted king. In John's gospel, we read, Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas, Caiaphas is a high priest, to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover, a Jewish uh, festival. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered here, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, I have written what I have written. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus' coronation does not come with jewels, a throne, and a crown of gold. 
It comes with nails, a wooden stake, and a crown of thorns. But how? How can this be glory? How can a tortured, bleeding man, nailed to a wooden cross, betrayed, broken, rejected, and despised by his own people, be God's exalted one? How can Jesus' crucifixion simultaneously be his exaltation and coronation? As I've already suggested, this is a real paradox for us. Glory, we think, is beauty. It is power. It is success, wealth, and fame. Exaltation is prominence. It is superiority. It is being above, looking down. Jesus on the cross is none of these things. His body is broken, twisted, and bleeding. On the cross, Jesus has no apparent success, wealth, or power. Far from being being prominent, he is classed among criminals. He is spit upon, mocked, and shamed. And so we come back to the paradox. How can John expect us to see glory here when the cross is the exact opposite of it? The answer to this paradox is to realize that we are, in one sense, wrong. Glory is not what we believe it to be, or at least it is not found in the places that we look for it. As I just said, we look for glory and power and fame. But glory is actually found elsewhere, at least according to John. In God's eyes, glory is found in love. It is found in living out the heart of God. Or to put it another way, it is, to, it is using your life to reflect who God truly is. And John's gospel actually tells us this from the very beginning. In John chapter 1, verse 14, John testifies to us that he has seen Jesus' glory the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory that John has seen in Jesus is the grace and truth of God. Glory comes from displaying God's self-sacrificial love. And once we realize that this is what glory truly is, then we can resolve the paradox. Now hopefully we can see and understand the portrait of Jesus as the crucified and at the same time exalted king. Jesus is glorified on the cross precisely in the fact that it is on the cross that Jesus lays down his life for us. It is the place where he demonstrates that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Jesus' self-sacrificial death is the ultimate demonstration of God's heart for us. It is the decisive display of God's self-sacrificial love. And in that way, the cross is the exaltation and glorification of Christ the King. Now, before we finish the sermon this morning, it's worth thinking about the implications of John's portrait of Jesus for us today. The implications of the crucified and at the same time exalted king are nothing short of world changing. Just think about it with me. How much pain is caused in the world because people pursue their own glory in the wrong places? How many political leaders have started wars because of their pursuit of glory through power? How many million or billion dollar companies have cut corners and committed injustices in order to pursue glory through wealth? But what would happen if the pursuit of glory was redefined based on the cross? 
What would happen if leaders cared more about demonstrating God's justice and compassion than advancing their own power? What would happen if those with power in the world pursued glory by demonstrating God's self-sacrificial love? What would happen if we loved others the way that Jesus loved us? This, in fact, is precisely what John commands us to do, or Jesus commands us to do in John's gospel. In John 13, verses 34 to 35, Jesus says this. He says, A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. In his gospel, John gives us the portrait of the crucified and at the same time exalted king. Christ crucified is Christ glorified. The cross becomes his coronation because on it, Christ displays the self-sacrificial love of God. As followers of the king, let us pursue the same glory. Reveal with your life, your actions and your words, the heart of God. Love others as Christ has loved you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way that you have loved us by sending your Son into the world so that all who believe in him might have eternal life. Thank you that Jesus loved us to the end. And as we go from here, May we love others as he has loved us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I would invite uh, maybe Sheila and uh, another elder, either Tanya or Marianne, to uh, join me up on the uh, communion table if you're willing. Um, It is not difficult to move from thinking about the king of glory to the king's table. Around the communion table, we remember why it was necessary for Jesus to die in the first place. In John chapter 10, verse 11, as I referenced in the sermon, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus did not lay down his life for no reason. He died for the sheep. He died, in other words, for us. He gave his life so that we might experience divine forgiveness, have a relationship with the Father, and have eternal life. No matter who you are or what you've done, Jesus took your place on the cross, and his offer of forgiveness and eternal life is for you. And so over these next few moments, I want to uh, invite you to reflect in prayer as we have a time of silence. I invite you to reflect on Jesus, the exalted and at the same time crucified king. Remember his love for you and his offer of forgiveness. Remember his glory. Let's have a time of silence and then I will pray for the elements. Father, as we are anticipating taking communion together, we remember Christ crucified, 
Christ glorified. Thank you for the way that you were willing to send your son into our world so that whoever believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. I pray now that as we uh, take communion, that you would be honored and glorified and that we would be moved to love one another as you have loved us. God, assure us of your forgiveness for us when we fall short, and I pray that we would rest assured in your promise of forgiveness and right standing before you through Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. If you're listening online, I would invite you to get uh, bread and juice to uh, take communion with us. And if you're in person, I want to invite you to open the top clear strip to get at the communion wafer. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is Christ's body, broken for you. Take it and eat. Now I invite you to open the top seal to the juice. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Take it and drink. Will you stand with us as we sing together, Hosanna. I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire the whole earth shakes the whole earth shakes I see his love and mercy washing over all our sin the people sing the people sing Hosanna Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. I see a generation. 
rising up to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see a new revival stirring as we pray and seek. We're on our knees, we're on our knees. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Heal my heart and make it clean. to the things unseen show me how to love like you have loved me break my heart for what breaks yours everything i am for your kingdom's cause as i walk from earth into Eternity. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Join me with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he reigns as king over God's kingdom and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, his holy church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. And as I was listening this morning and thinking about Jesus exalted, I thought, what does that mean to us? And in Philippians 2, I think it tells us exactly what that means. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And if you go down to verse 9 in that, it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what he asks of us, to acknowledge him as King and Lord and to humble ourselves before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus who came, who humbled himself to death and ascended into heaven. Lord, we thank you for everything that he's done for each one of us. Help us to have that same humility, that same love, and Lord, help us to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.